and welcome to the CRM MVP podcast episode number 39. Uh, today's a show where I'm uh, recording by myself, actually. I'm, you know, it's it's one of those shows where I'm talking about things that I would like to see change in Dynamics or things I disagree with in Dynamics. So typically on these shows, because they might be a little controversial, I'd like to, you know, sort of keep guests out of harm's way. Um, and the funny thing about this is that, you know, uh, we just came back from the CRM User Group Summit a couple of weeks ago in, in Phoenix and... You know, during that summit, I had just released the previous episode, which are uh, things that I never do in Dynamics. Um, and that was, uh, I think, episode number 37. And I got a lot of feedback for that. Um, the feedback was sort of split in two. It was the feedback from the camp of people who agree with me, uh, obviously in, in a lot of those, maybe not on all of them. Uh, and then the feedback from people who would you know, like I mentioned on the episode, take a stand against saying that they would never do something, that they they feel there are some situations where, you know, you, you do some things um, where, where you're sort of forced to use them. And, you know, they don't sort of follow the whole principle of here I am to proclaim that I'm never going to do this. Um, so it, it was sort of interesting to, to hear the feedback. And I think out of the list of the things that I never do or use in Dynamics, there was one in particular that, that sort of generated a lot of buzz and a lot of conversation while we were there and a lot of people sort of taking a side, let's say, on the discussion, which was the whole conversation about managed versus unmanaged solutions. And as I mentioned on that episode, and I think I probably mentioned that too on episode number 20, where I talk about the 20 best practices I don't follow, which is the idea or the best practice of using managed solutions when it comes to moving functionality from one environment to another. And as I mentioned on the last episode, I invited four other experts so we can sort of get together and talk about this thing and at least end up with a, a three to two vote where we, you know, at least we settled the conversation uh, the way I saw it. And I was, uh, I guess, pleasantly surprised that they agree with me. And I think that, you know, there were a couple of situations, I think, uh, especially from Seth and Nick, where we sort of saw that there were or they saw that there were a couple of situations where I think managed solutions will be OK. I still stand again with the whole idea that I just don't see the benefit of it uh, when I when I think of managed solutions, I don't see the benefit. I think that I agree with them uh, on the sense that the fact that you use managed solutions doesn't mean that it's going to be locked up and that you're doomed for life. Uh, that's not the case. I think that if you follow best practices, if you know what you're doing, if you follow the right ALM and take your backups and take precautions, essentially, um, you'll be okay with managed solutions. But then on the other side, I just don't see the real world benefit of them. I mean, the fact that you can remove them from production if you mess up is not of a good enough benefit. It's not a realistic benefit because, again, once it makes it to production, if you're following best practices, you know, you know that that's functionality you want to have in production. Why would why would it ever make it to production and you want to uninstall it? I just don't see it. And then obviously the, there were some other uh, conversations about, well, you know, there are, you know, it's easier to to keep track of of um, you know change management or or it's easy to keep track of versioning or I I just don't see it. I you know it's as easy as keeping track of versioning and unmanaged too. I I. And anyway, I, I obviously we talked about that on the last episode. I'm not going to go back to talk about that. I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that uh, the reason why we had episode number 38 uh, on managed and unmanaged solutions was because of the feedback directly during the uh, CRM user group summit. And again, I think that the the fact that is being downloaded so much that episode clearly tells the story that there's a lot of people who are passionate about that. Um, there's a lot of people who, you know, stand on one side or the other. So it was great to, to get that feedback during the, uh, during the summit. And that's one thing that I'm always looking for is to get feedback. The other piece of feedback that I got during the, um, during the summit was people were sort of talking about why do I focus so much on, on top 10 of anything, Right. People are talking about, well, why are you really covering these things like here are the top 20 best practices or top 10 thing, top 10 confrontations, top 10, you know, things or features that I never use in Dynamics. Why do you focus so much in this top 10 um, sort of theme, right? And 
I, I think that the best way to explain it is that I, I really like to do top 10 lists or, or the 10 things that I never do or whatever it is. I think it's because of George Carlin. So if you're unfamiliar with George Carlin, George Carlin is one of my favorite comedians. He's a stand-up comedian. He's dead already. Um, but he's great. I really love him. And, you know, as he got older, uh, he got funnier, uh, in my opinion. So uh, he did a, a bit years and years and years ago. I remember watching about the Ten Commandments and sort of why there's Ten Commandments and, you know, why there's no less or more than Ten Commandments. And I think that's that that really explains the reason why I like it so much. And actually, let's do this. Let me let me just play a little bit of that skit. Not not the whole thing, but. Let me just play a little bit to to sort of illustrate why I like these uh, ten top ten or ten lists, uh, ten things that I do in dynamics or whatever. Let's just. That's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's really the reason why I like to focus on, on some of these episodes on the 10 things um, that match whatever topic we're discussing that week. And this episode is no different. Uh, and actually, the next episode is also the same. I wanted to focus the next two episodes on features within Dynamics 365. But I wanted to see the two sides of the coin. This episode, number 39, will be 10 features that, in my opinion, should be removed from Dynamics 365 customer engagement or CRM, if you call it CRM. I think they're useless at this point. I think that, you know, maybe these features should be re-engineered or removed or maybe replaced by a, a better option out there that might be available in another business application or perhaps we have a third-party solution or a free solution that does a better job. So anyway, I will go through a list of the top 10 things. Well, I wouldn't say top 10 because there's more than 10 and these are probably not my top 10. If I had to think about this thing for like a month, I would probably come up with a with a better list. But let's just say these are 10 features that I think should be removed from Dynamics 365 customer engagement. And just like we did before, I encourage you to take notes. I encourage you to let me know what you agree with. Maybe I talk about some of these features and you completely disagree with them. That's awesome. Please bring it up. Uh, hopefully you're listening to this um, and you know we get to meet at an event. Uh, obviously, I'll be at Extreme 365 in Austin. So if you're there, let me know and, and we can talk about this one. And perhaps the next episode as well, the next episode will be 10 features that should be added to Dynamics 365 customer engagement that they either have been a long time coming and they haven't been added or that I think should be added to the product to make it better. So again, that will be episode number 40 will be 10 things that should be added to Dynamics. Today, we will focus on 10 things or 10 features that should be removed. So without further ado, Let's go with episode number 39. So as I mentioned, this list doesn't really have any order. I just wrote down 10 things. The first 10 things that came to my mind when it comes to things that I should, you know, see out of Dynamics 365, either because they're useless or because they, you know, they, they just don't work as good as they should. They should be improved. They should be changed. Something should be introduced to replace them. So let's let's just go with the list. So on number one, uh, the number one feature, and again, this is not the most important one, but on the list, on my list, the number one feature that should be removed from Dynamics 365 customer engagement is the Outlook client, the actual Outlook client. And we recorded a, a, a video. If you haven't watched it, I encourage you to go to YouTube to and, and just type CRM MVP podcast. We have a channel there and we just released a video that we recorded during the uh, the summit in Phoenix um, at Tombstone. So we got to go to Tombstone and I asked Gustav and Mark, we're both CRM MVPs, you know, what's what feature in Dynamics is too tough to die? They've tried to kill it, but they just can't. And uh, Gustav mentioned the Outlook client, but I think it should die. I think it should really make it go away. 
Now, we have the app for Outlook. Obviously, I'm not talking about integration with Outlook. That cannot go away. That's one of the main selling points of Dynamics 365. I'm talking about the thick client, right? The app, the add-in, the, the one that you install on your computer and you have to configure for every user and that crashes the machines because you know, inevitably you will find customers that have either old computers that will are already struggling with Outlook to load up without any add-ins and now you're going to you know, drop this add-in for Dynamics on top of it that is going to try to synchronize all the contacts and all of the, um, you know, activities and, and things like that that are in Dynamics 365. Because remember, when we think about the Outlook client, synchronization between Outlook and Dynamics 365 is, even though it's, you know, two ways out of the box, nothing from your Outlook will synchronize to Dynamics automatically. You have to essentially select it and click on that track button so the the records will move from outlook or from exchange if you want to see it that way to dynamics 365 however everything that's on dynamics 365 meaning by everything meaning emails um, contacts tasks activities things like that everything in dynamics 365 that you don't have in outlook or you don't have an exchange will be synchronized automatically so there will be some synchronization automatically the first time you open a configured outlook client so I think that the Outlook add-in will do a better job by not having to be a client that is installed on the local machine. Now, granted, there is some functionality in the Outlook client, I'm talking about the, the thick Outlook client, not the app for Outlook, that is not available in the app for Outlook. You know, the way that you can navigate, for example, to all your Dynamics 365 data, there's no way to do that really on the add-in today, or at least not as easy as you do it today. You can see the data because when you track emails and you set regarding, you're able to connect to Dynamics 365 and see the records there and able to connect these, you know, emails or whatever you're trying to track into Dynamics, you're able to connect it to data. So you can somewhat connect to it and see it, but the navigation is not as easy as it is in, in the Outlook client. In the Outlook client, we can see all of the data from Dynamics. You can create your own views. You can pin views, which then cache essentially all the records in one page. So you don't have to go page by page if you can only see 250 records by page. And by the way, I think that limit should be also removed. It's not on the list, but I just thought of it. So the 250 uh, limitation by page should be gone at least give us a way to configure it, right? If we want to make it 10,000 records per page and that's going to kill performance, well, let us make the decision on that. Uh, so anyway, that was just a bonus on the list and since we were just talking about it. But, you know, in Outlook, we have a few things that I really, really like about the Outlook client. For example, the fact that I can use conditional formatting on views. I can make records show up in red or green. So, you know, maybe opportunities where the bit date is coming to an end or, or is coming soon within the next week or within the next month, you know, make them red or make an orange so they can stand out. So as I'm navigating through dynamics in Outlook, Outlook can sort of layer this formatting on top. It can group records together on top that you can't really do with dynamics unless you're using editable grids and then you use the grouping, you know, uh, conditions or the grouping functionality there. There was really no way to do it. Uh, group records in dynamics but the outlook client can you can create grouping conditions and it will put them together so maybe if you have a let's say a five stage selling process you could group your opportunities by the sell stage wherever they are um or if you're, you know, on on a working with customer service, maybe you want to group the cases based on where they are in the process. If you're, you know, just talking to the customer or researching or closing the case, whatever it is, you can group them together. So again, you can apply all these things that Outlook is capable of. These are Outlook functionalities, you know, and you know, flags and and categories. And I mean, there's just a lot of stuff within the Outlook client that you just don't have on the app for Outlook. So you know, I think that. Number one on the list is sort of a two ways and an improvement of the of the app for Outlook. So give us some of the functionality that the Outlook client is doing today, but then get rid of the Outlook client at the same time. So that's that's what I want to see. I want to see a better app for Outlook um, that actually makes the Outlook client obsolete. Uh, the add it, the add in, or the sorry, the app for Outlook is is great. It works on phones. It works on Macs, right? On on Outlook on the Mac. Uh, that's something that the client for Outlook doesn't do. So um, I think that that's the future of it. I would like to see that tremendously improved and finally get rid of the Outlook client. If you notice, there's one thing I didn't mention as a as a benefit of using the Outlook client, which some people would disagree with me. They would think that that's a benefit, which is the ability to go into offline mode. 
in the Outlook client. Yes, that's a feature of the Outlook client, but I think that feature is, again, it shouldn't be used. I talked about that as a best practice, or, or I talked about that um, on one of the episodes before. I think offline mode in the Outlook client is wrong. It's a mistake. I think no one should use that. Um, the fact that you might be unhappy with your performance of Dynamics 365 on a server, and now you're going to download a subset of that functionality to your local machine, install some local copy of SQL Server Express and download all the data and you know your automation will run locally. Like It's just going to kill performance and it's going to kill Outlook. So you shouldn't use it at all. I always recommend that if you're going to be offline, use the mobile clients for that. Mobile clients are better at displaying the offline functionality. So I think that if you're not going to get rid of the Outlook client right now, at least disable offline mode. I think that should be removed. It shouldn't be an option. We shouldn't have a button in there sort of tempting users or people to click on it and install uh, offline mode. I, just get rid of it, right? Uh, and then... Once you improve the app for Outlook, get rid of the Outlook client ultimately. The integration with Outlook needs to stay. Obviously, the integration with Outlook is one of the biggest selling points and biggest features of Dynamics. So that cannot go away. But the client, we don't need it. Just get rid of it. All right, number two on the list, Mail Merge. Mail Merge is a pain to deal with. Um, you know, the idea that I have to go through a 15 or 16 click process to try to print a quote into a, a Word document is, it's just, it's just insane. Right. And, and I think that it's been improved with the, with the introduction of the Excel templates and the Word templates. I think they were introduced in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 2013, it, it was a couple of versions ago. Um, and now we have sort of a, it's not, it's not quite a single click to export to Word, but it's pretty close. And I would have to assume that you can always add a custom button if you really want to make it a single click. But, um, you know, th there's just a button on the on the form that says sort of uh, export to Word or something. And you select the template and then there it goes. So it's only a couple of clicks. It was tremendously improved. But the mail merge functionality is still out there. The templates are still out there. Um, and, and the worst part of it is that, you know, with some of the relationship insights functionality, some of that templating functionality was improved to tell you which templates are, you know, being opened the most by, by your customers and stuff like that. So I feel like it's there to stay. The whole template and mail merge functionality of Dynamics, it's there to stay for a while. And I, I just wish it was gone. I think there's better ways to do it. Um, I think that, you know, perhaps on the next episode, I'll talk about sort of my wish list of what this functionality should be like. Um, I'll probably make it number one on the list, just so you, you remember. Um, but again, I just think that the out of the box, the one that we've had for so many versions until now, mail merge should be gone. And I'm fully aware that there are some customers out there who are still in on-prem, who are still in, you know, old versions of Dynamics that are unhappy to hear me talk about you know they should get rid of mill merger they should get rid of the outlook client because they're you know older implementations of them you know that you need to update you need to you know get up to speed with the latest version because again we i i feel that and, and one of the reasons why I'm, I'm such an advocate of of shutting down on premise is because i really feel that you know we need to evolve we need to move forward and get better when it comes to innovation if we want to compete with some of these other you know big uh, companies and big CRM platforms out there. So um, that's, you know, I, I, I'm not adding on premise to this list, by the way. So if you're listening in and saying, I, I wonder at what point Gus is going to say, get rid of on prem altogether. I've already said that multiple times. I've said that, you know, face to face to Microsoft leadership. I, you know, I've been a pretty advocate, um, you know, for, for getting rid of on premise. I think that, you know, we should go to the cloud. Uh, for everybody and you know I think that some of the functionality that we have like virtual entities and things like that will give organizations the ability to keep some of their data on-prem if they wish to do so if they don't want to push their data to the cloud or they're not allowed to do it if they you know by law or you know because they need to be uh, protective of their data even though I think that keeping the data on-prem is way scarier and, and less secure than having it on the cloud whatever it is if that's what you feel like it there are ways that you can keep your data on-prem and still be online for, and use the functionality online and I think once every customer is online we will move you know a lot faster when it comes to innovation and fixing things so 
anyway, that's just my two cents on that. I didn't even add on-prem to the list. That's sort of implied. Okay, number three is the old knowledge base. Why do we still have an old knowledge base? The new knowledge base was included or introduced, what was it, in CRM 2013 or something, or 2015 when the unified, um, well, the unified interface, which was, you know, it was a different client before. Um, when that was introduced, we sort of saw the new knowledge base. But still, if you go within the service section in Dynamics and go to the knowledge base, you go to the old one. And then you have a link that says go to the new one. But then if you go to the case form, there's a place for the old one and the new one. So both of them are reflected on it. Like I understand that that you know, there are some organizations out there who've had knowledge bases for a long time and you cannot just rip it off and be done with it. But it is documented that there's a way to move or transfer things, transfer articles and things you're using in the old knowledge base to the new knowledge base. It is documented. Now you may you may uh, make it the argument that, well, even if you transfer the articles, we still want to see historic records. We still want to be able to go back to cases we closed a year ago or two years ago and be able that they were resolved by sending one of our old knowledge base articles to the customers. They follow the instructions and you know they were able to resolve the 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 case. Cool. If you want to do that, then let's figure out a way to to keep it for historical records. But just wipe it out altogether, like the ability to go back and see it, improve it, publish it, like all that stuff. Just no, no, just turn it off, right? Make it read only for a year or two and then get rid of it eventually. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty uh, one or zero when it comes to some of this functionality. And I think during this list, you'll see that there's a couple of things here that, you know, we should we should definitely uh turn it off and, and you'll probably disagree with that. But again, the all knowledge base, it just makes it super confusing. If you try to teach one of your customers or like in my case, I teach other partners sometimes and, and professionals out there how to use the customer service side or get certified on the customer service side or whatever it is, trying to explain the fact that we have two knowledge bases still lurking around, this doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, okay, so the old functionality was evolved and now we have the new one. Just get rid of it. And the same thing applies to, for example, you see like uh, when you go to SLAs, right? Initially, we had service level agreements. And then Microsoft came up with enhanced SLAs, which were really supposed to be SLAs to begin with, giving us the ability to pause, for example, when we're waiting for the customer for an answer to make sure we're not violating SLA, things like that. Those improvements and being able to timestamp it, the, the different um, SLA, I guess, um, I guess milestones and whatnot, those events, that is really how SLAs should work. Why do we still have standard SLAs around? And I know they're being deprecated, but there's still the option is there. It's not about deprecating them. It's about getting rid of them. Um, I feel like it. So some of these things um, should be just wiped out completely. And by the way, standard SLAs are not on the list. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Number four is leads. This might be the probably the most controversial one on the list. I think that this is probably going to split people half and half sort of like managed and unmanaged solutions does. I think that there's people out there who are big fans of leads. I personally don't see the need for them. I think that I'm on the camp of, you know, I use leads. I, I use leads a lot more often than I use uh, managed solutions, but I cannot think of a project where the lead entity couldn't have been replaced by using, you know, uh, uh, an account, the account entity, the contact entity, or whatever it is, um, because in a lot of cases, so the way the way I learn leads, and this maybe this is wrong, but the way I learn leads are, if you're a business and somebody reaches out to you, or you reach out, you know, you're reaching out to a prospect that maybe they buy what you sell, they are a lead. They're a lead as long as you don't know if they buy what you sell or if you sell what they want to buy because it goes both ways. Now, how does it go both ways? Let's say you sell, you're a construction company, okay? You you focus in commercial construction and you have a list of companies out there. Maybe you focus on building, let's say, offices for dentists and other medical professions, right? So you have a list out there of a bunch of people who may be interested on building a new location for their practice. Maybe you bought a list 
of dentists across the southeast of the United States that have been on the same address for 10 years or more, something like that. Maybe that is the list of people that you're going to be dealing with. That way you can call these people and say, look, you've been on the same building for 10 years. Maybe it's time to get a new one, new office, bigger office, whatever, and start growing. Or maybe five years. I don't know. I'm just making something up. I don't know about this business. But if that's the case, you're going to start calling somebody and see if they're interested, right? That's a lead because you don't know if they're interested in buying what you're selling. But the same works the other way around. If you give somebody a card because you're attending an event, like for example, uh, we were at the summit, I gave a lot of people cards that asked me for them, but then they reach out to me and they ask me to do something I'm not familiar with. Let's say I gave somebody a card and they're like, hey, we're getting ready to implement finance and operations. Can you help me out? I'm not comfortable implementing finance and operations. I can do it. In that case, for me, that's a lead. We're trying to identify if what you're looking for, which is a finance and operations expert, is something that I can sell. And I don't offer expert services in FNO. So I won't be, I will disqualify you. So that is how leads are supposed to be used is while you're at the point where you don't know if that other person or company can actually buy what you sell or you can provide what they want. That is what a lead is used for. And then once the answer is yes, once they are interested or they buy what I sell or I can sell what they're trying to buy, once the answer is yes to that, then it moves into an opportunity. That's how leads are supposed to be used. At least that's how I've learned them over the years. However, you can still do that with account and contacts and other entities in the system. Um, I think that in some cases it might be easier to just use accounts and contacts because you can train your users not to create duplicates. However, unless you have your duplicate detection game in line, meaning checking leads against contacts and accounts uh, for potential duplicates and all of that, and then having the users select the right account and the right contact on the existing account and contact fields within the lead, unless you're doing all of that, you're going to end up with a mess, a potentially a mess, right? With a bunch of people putting leads in the system, which again, sometimes you just enter them in bulk, right? You're collecting business cards at an event or you have a, you know, one of those scanners. Like if you were on the expo floor at the summit, people were scanning badges. Um, you know, you have one of those scanners and you end up with a, a list in Excel of a thousand people who you scan. What are you going to do? Are you going to check one by one to see if, the, you know, you import them, you import them as leads. That's what you're going to do. And then you have to go through the list. I, I just don't think that's the best way to do it. Um, you know, I, I realize that some companies, for some organizations, that is the best way to do it. But I feel that it can introduce some problems, unforeseen problems that I, I, there's not a whole lot of benefits that you get on the other end. Um, so I think that leads should be gone out of dynamics. Now, my fear is that if they remove this functionality, we're going to see a spike on custom entities created to sort of replace leads. And then People having to essentially use code, whether you write your own or whether you use something like the Ultimate Workflow Kit from, from Andrew Butenko uh, that has a, a custom workflow step that essentially mimics the qualify lead or disqualify lead button functionality. Uh, I think that we might see a spike on that uh, from people who are you know, pro leads, let's just say, but um, I don't think it would hurt too many people to do that. And I think that the people that would be hurt by using leads in the majority would be people who are using leads incorrectly. People who are, you know, entering a bunch of data in there just to see what happens or they're not, they're not using it correctly. And, and I use, I use leads as a, as the prime example of one of the entities that is typically sort of reused. Uh, in the wrong way. You know, we are, I'm all about use what's out of the box. Don't create, you know, more complexity and add customizations if you can avoid it, if you can use something in there. But there's people who will transform leads, which has the, essentially the, the background I just mentioned and how they should be used. And they use that for something else to so start collecting completely, something completely different than what I just talked about, um, than what I just talked about. So um, leads are typically abused. I just don't think we need it. Don't use the leads entity if you can prevent it. So number four, leads. So we're almost halfway. All right, for number five, I would say, man, this one is a pain. And I think um, I'm going to get 100% agreement on this one. So if you were, if you were against me on leads, I'm going to win you back on number five. Uneditable entities. 
what are uneditable entities? I don't know why there's like that 2% or 1% of annoying entities in Dynamics that you cannot change. Like, for example, the opportunity close entity, right? When you close an opportunity as one, you get that pop-up that says, you know, what's your actual revenue? What's the actual close? That You cannot edit that thing. There's nothing you can do to it. So what a lot of people end up doing is they have to create this custom entity or, or this dialogue or whatever, some other mechanism that, you know, closes the opportunity as one because they want to be able to collect other information. Um, now, obviously, I try to stay away from using custom solutions, so I try to collect the information on the opportunity. But, I mean, there are some cases where you just don't, don't want some of the fields that are there. You want to rename it or you want to do something to them. They're locked up. The same is the case for when you're closing a case. And, and again, there's a, a few entities in the system that are un, uneditable. They are just a pain, right, to deal with the fact that you have to create something custom just to have a field name something different. It, it's insane to me. That needs to be changed. That needs to be gone. Not the entities themselves, just the fact that they are uneditable. Just make it all editable. If we can change anything, just make it 100% dynamics. I can change anything. Um, so anyway, that is number five on the list. For number six, locked field data types. Um, you know, this one is interesting because I feel that I've gotten pretty good at following best practices when it comes to creating fields, so I don't need this as often. But at the same time, I'm looking from sort of from the outside in with the administrators that I train and all the people you see, you meet at the summit that, that struggle with this. You know, why can't you change data types on fields? Why? Why when, you know, and, and by the way, what I'm talking about is you create a field that is a single line of text, you cannot change it to multiple line of text. Or if you create a field that is whole number, you cannot change it to decimal number, right? Once you pick the data type on the field, you're pretty much stuck. The same thing if you say that a field is going to be simple versus calculator or whatever it is, it's going to be changed. Now, I realize that when you create a field, things happen. I get that 100%. Uh, so for those of you who are thinking like, well, the reason why you do that is because when you create a calculated field, multiple columns are created on the database. Blah, blah. I get that. Um, I understand how it works technically. But there are solutions out there that can get around this, right? If you take a look at the XRM Toolbox Attribute Manager, which is one of the plugins in there, it was created by Daryl Labar, another CRM MVP, and he's been on the show multiple times. One of my favorite free tools for Dynamics. The Attribute Manager can do that. Right now, it doesn't really right again. If you're sitting back there, because it doesn't really change the type. It's true. It doesn't change the type on the existing field, but it goes through the motions that you have to go through manually if you mess up. Right. What are those motions? You need to go back, find the field, find any dependencies on the field. So if it's on forms or in views or in workflows or whatever it is, you have to go back, find those. Add a brand new field with the type that you want, find the dependencies and replace it, then take all of the data from one field, move it to the other, copy and whatever, migrate the data somehow, get rid of the old field. All of those things that you have to do manually today, the tool, Attribute Manager from the XRM Toolbox, from Daryl's tool, does that automatically behind the scenes. All those steps are done. So it's not simply changing the data type. I get that. But it's fixing it if you made a mistake, right? That's the whole point of it. Why can you change them? Why can Dynamics do what the attribute manager can do? I get that you cannot just swap the, the data fields. I get that. The whole number is storing half the amount of bytes that it takes to store a decimal number. So because of that, you cannot just change it. But how hard can it be? And maybe the answer is super hard. It's impossible. But from me as a non-developer looking in, how hard can it be to be able to go to a whole number just to pick that example and add the capabilities to capture, you know, d double the amount of bytes? How hard is that? I don't know. But the attribute manager figure it out by recreating the fields and going through all the motions and all the steps. I wonder if there's a better way to do it. But even if there's no better way to do it, at least the attribute manager does it for you. So the fact that you're stuck, if you pick the wrong data type from the beginning, it's a pain, right? Um, so I think that the fact that data types are locked today in the system should be changed. 
I think that um, we should have the ability to change the data type, even if it takes long, even if you get a pop-up that says, okay, this is about to take, you know, 15 minutes, cool, but at least give me the option to do it. Right now, we don't have the option, so um, that is number six. Number seven, uh, this one comes to no surprise, right? Contracts. Contracts were replaced by entitlements and SLAs years and years and years ago. I think it was CRM 2013, maybe. Uh, so it's been five years or whatever it is since this thing was was introduced, uh, entitlements and SLAs. And obviously, as I mentioned earlier, SLAs were replaced by a better version of SLAs, which should be gone. Uh, the, the old version should be gone, as I, as I mentioned. And I know they were deprecated, but they're still there. Um, so the enhanced SLAs or what we call SLAs today and entitlements replace the contract functionality. Contracts is a super complex uh, entity to deal with. I don't know if any of you have done work with a contract entity, but it's a pain to deal with in, in a variety of cases. Um, you know, the it is super flexible in terms of capturing details of the contract. So I like that. I like the fact that even in complex situations for support contracts or whatever it is, I have the flexibility of inputting uh, the information that I need. But when it comes to changing it, like for example, if you have a customer that says, look, I'm going to pay you X amount of money to have the ability to create 10 tickets a month, just to pick an example, you say, perfect, a year contract for 10 tickets a month, go. And then two months later, when they see that they're using more and more tickets or running out of tickets, they say, you know what, can we amend it? And now let's switch to 20 tickets a month. Man, it's a pain to go back into a contract and fix that. Um, so I think that entitlements and SLAs do the job way better than contracts. And I think it was the right move to introduce that. I don't, I don't think anyone, you know, sort of, uh, cries for the good old days of using contracts, but why are they still contracts in the system? Why? And I understand that back five years ago, you know, we were on that position where, yeah, we have entitlements and SLAs and companies are going to start using entitlements and SLAs going forward, but they still have contracts and they still have customers that have contracts in place, you know, so we need to keep the functionality there, right? But that was five years ago. Are there still companies out there with contracts that cannot get rid of or replace with entitlements and SLAs five years later? And I fully understand that there are companies out there that have contracts that are longer than five years. I get that, right? You have companies out there that will have a you know maintenance contract or whatever it is for 15, 20 years. I get that. But by this point, you should be able to have it replaced with entitlements and SLAs. Right. So five years ago, when this functionality came out, you say, oh, I just renewed a contract for 20 years. Go and redo it with entitlements and SLAs. Yeah, but we have a million contracts and it would take a lot of time. Well, how about five years, five years to replace all your contracts with entitlements and SLAs? I, you know, like it's I, I don't think he's asking too much uh, at this point that all of the organizations that are still using contracts should be in entitlements and SLAs by now and just eliminate the contract functionality out of Dynamics. Now, I realize that most people don't use contracts, so it doesn't bother them. They will shut it down through the app designer and not show it on the navigation or they would uh, shut it down through security roles or whatever it is. But the fact that it's still there and that for some organizations, they don't get rid of it because they see the word contracts and they are like, oh, this might be important, so I'm going to leave it in there. Um, it's just an eyesore, an unnecessary eyesore, essentially, because they we have a better way to do it. Um, so I think contracts should be removed out of Dynamics 365. And we get to number eight. Number eight, non-editable grids. Now, why do I mean by that? Not get rid of it in terms of don't allow people to use non-editable grids, because I think in some cases you do want that. But why do we have to enable editable grids still? When they were introduced, obviously you were used to by then to use um, non-editable grids. So it's maybe hard if you're a user to make the transition to an editable grid. You, know, you might click on it by mistake and overwrite something. I get that, right? You're used to the UI where you can click on it, select the record, not go into a box or a field and sort of be able to type something. I understand that. I understand that for existing customers, 
maybe we cannot enable it by default. But what about new customers that have never used Dynamics? Why, if I go into a trial, assuming that I'm a brand new customer coming from Salesforce or whatever, why do I have to then enable them and enable them entity by entity? Not even like, let's have a setting on the system setting that enables all the grids in Dynamics to be editable. Like, why don't we have that? That would be awesome. At least, if we're not going to enable them by default, give me a checkbox. Give me a button, even with three warnings that says, but, you know, remember that now they're going to be editable and you can mess it. doesn't matter. I want to be able to say, yes, I want all my grids to be editable, right? So I think that having non-editable grids by default is a mistake at this time uh, for brand new customers, especially. Uh, so anyone, I think, starting on, you know, version nine should be already editable and ready to go. I realized that editable grids was a huge improvement in version eight. I think the people coming in from seven or six or, you know, 2015, et cetera, uh, were sort of surprised positively. I, I haven't heard anyone who was negatively uh, impacted by the fact that editable grids was added as an option. I think that maybe people like uh, Dave Barry who had a solution for editable grids, maybe he, he wasn't happy. Maybe he was happy that Microsoft now has the ability to do that out of the box and you don't need to maintain a solution that you know he created to, to have editable grids. But at the same time, it's like everyone loves the fact that the grids can now be editable. But why do we have to go and enable them? It doesn't make any sense. Just make them enable by default and let me turn them off if I if I want to go back to the way it was before. It's like um, a good example is autosave. Autosave was included. Um, what was it? I think it was it was in 2011. In 2011, we still had to save. Maybe it was introducing like late 2011 where we could turn it on, but it was off by default. And then in 2013, it was on by default. Why didn't we do that? We should have done that with uh, with editable grids. Just enable them by default and give us the chance to turn it off. So I think when autosave came up, um, it was a good move that on the next version that was available, have it on by default. You can turn it off. You can still turn it off today, by the way. Uh, it sort of it became part of Dynamics. Dynamics is autosave. No one even thinks about the fact that, that it wasn't uh, enabled for autosave in the past. But you can still turn it on today if you or turn it off today if you want to go back to having that button. And I, I actually had a customer about a month ago who requested. Uh, they, they were using Dynamics a long time ago. Then they went to Salesforce for a couple of years. And now they're back into Dynamics 365 online. And they came back to me and he was like, Gus, can we have that save and close button? And to be honest with you, I mean, there's not a whole lot of uh, more satisfying things in Dynamics that click in on that save and close button. It's awesome. Um, so they asked me, can we get that save and close button back? Because we miss it from CRM 2011. I want to be able to make changes and click on save and close and go back to the to the grid or to the view. And uh, yeah, absolutely. You can get it by turning off autosave. You turn off autosave and boom, you get your save and save and close buttons back. Um, so they're there. They're just, you know, off by default, but you can bring them back. So uh, again, uh, number eight, non-editable grids by default. No, let's just make them editable by default. Number nine, I think they should get rid of the import data wizard. The import data wizard, it's it's archaic at this point, and it was improved a couple of versions ago by allowing us to drag and drop, I guess, uh, records into it instead of having to browse. So maybe that was an improvement, but still the actual features of importing data were not improved. The actual features that allow us to bring data into the system were not really improved. For example, there's no really support for upserts unless you already exported the data from Dynamics. So yes, for those of you before you start yelling, if you take the data from Dynamics and you export to Excel by default, just single click export to Excel, it will allow you to upsert. Upsert is updates and inserts, meaning if you make changes to the data that was exported or if you add new rows below under the data that was exported, those records will be created or will be updated if you updated the data. That is what I call upserts, right? So upserts, if you 
exported the data from Dynamics are supported through the Import Data Wizard, but not the other way around. There's no option to do that. And what I mean by that is, you know, you imported a, a, you imported a bunch of accounts in the system. You work on the system for about a month. Now you go back and get an updated, you know, export of the data. There's no way for me through the Import Data Wizard, assuming that this is a CSV file coming from another source, there's no way for me to say, oh, by the way, this data is already in the system, so just update whatever records you find. There's no way to do upsearch, okay, with the Import Data Wizard when you use just regular CSV files to import into Dynamics. So that functionality is not there. There's no place for me to schedule. So if I'm going to import a bunch of data and I don't want to do it during hours, maybe I can queue it up. So my import kicks in at you know one in the morning because it takes three hours to import data or whatever it is. There's no way to schedule that. There's no way to even do it through a, a task manager or something on Windows. There, there, there's no, no way to really schedule. You have to like wake up at one and do it. Uh, or do it during during uh, work hours, which is you know is not something that you're you're looking to do. So uh, that's something to to keep in mind. Um, also, there's some entities that are straight up just not supported or too complex to import. Um, for example, if you're trying to import products and all of the settings within the product catalog, like the unit and the price list and all that stuff, all combined. There's really no way to do that with the import data wizard, or at least not an easy way to do it. You can import products, but the product catalog won't work. You cannot add products unless they have all these other stuff, right? That you might be familiar or not familiar with, like you know, unit groups and default units and price list and well, discount lists are optional, but you get the point. If you're trying to import discount lists from another system, the, how are you going to import discount lists into Dynamics with the import data wizard? That just it doesn't exist. Um, now, you may say, but Gus, why would you want to have the product catalog in Dynamics and not in an ERP system? I totally hear you there. I think that you should have it in ERP if that's the way you're going to do it. You should have an integration in place. But there are some companies that just don't want to do that. There are some companies that want to be able to create quotes from Dynamics, even though they have a product catalog in ERP. They just want to be able to add some products into the opportunity uh, or into the quotes and be able to print them out, send it to the customer, have it approved, and then in ERP do the actual invoice with the actual you know, products and all of that stuff. There's some companies that just don't need it, right? So for those companies, using the product catalog makes sense. And again, this point, number nine, is not about the product catalog. I'm not saying get rid of the product catalog or anything like that. What I'm saying is the import data wizard struggles to you know import things like that. How do you import emails with attachments on them with the import data wizard? Impossible, right? So again, I feel that it's time to, you know, sort of, I don't know if there's a nice way to say kill it, but it's time for us to move forward. I think there are other technologies out there that we can leverage instead of the import data wizard. And I think that, you know, unless we're going to call the import data wizard the re-import Excel data wizard, um, I just don't see it, uh, how really this can stand to uh, on a real implementation to import data or anything like that. Yes, we do have the date, the salesforce.com or whatever um, data maps in there by default and stuff. But you know we, what we have today, we have just straight up connectors with flow and power apps that we can actually use to take the data from salesforce.com and push it into dynamic. We have better ways to do it already um, than the import data wizard. So I think the import data wizard should go away. Um, we will talk about data imports and data integrations on the next episode and things that I think should be added to dynamic. So I'm not going to go into too much detail with number nine here with the import data wizard. I just think that the current data wizard should be wiped out. So that's uh, why it's on my list for number nine. Finally, number 10. And again, just to reiterate, this list is not a top 10 list. This is not the least important or the more important. It's just 10 features that I believe should be removed. And honestly, this list could have been, I and I thought about this, by the way, I thought about because this was episode 39, um, I thought about doing my, you know, 39 features that should be removed from Dynamics because the list goes on and on and on. There's a lot of stuff in there that I believe should be should be removed. Maybe we'll do part two 
of 10 features that should be removed out of Dynamics. I think that doing 39 would have made this episode too long. So uh, because we're already, you know, like 50 minutes in and we're still uh, we only covered nine so far. So imagine having 30 to go by this point. It will be too long. It will be some, uh, you know, uh, hardcore history, Dan Carlin's har hardcore history length. Uh, episodes kind of thing. It, uh, by the way, Hardcore History is one of my favorite podcasts. So, But I digress. Let's talk about number 10. Number 10 on the list of 10 features that should be removed from Dynamics 365 customer engagement is those pesky fetch XML limits. Man, I'm sick of them. I'm tired of the fetch XML limits. And for those of you who are not familiar with the fetch XML limits, let me give you a few right off the top of my head. And there's more. Uh, but let me just give you the ones that I struggle with the most, the ones that pain me the most. Um, first off, why can we compare two fields in Fetch XML? Why can I say, find me accounts where telephone one equals telephone two, whatever you know value is in those fields? Like that sounds to me like it's so simple to do, but it's impossible to do in Fetch XML or advanced find if you want to call that advanced find today. That is a pain. And I realized that Fetch XML is a language that was... You know, I, I don't know if it was just invented for Dynamics, but it's only um, it's used in Dynamics 365 online and on-prem to search for records on the on the database, on the CRM database or the Dynamics 365 database. Um, the fact that I cannot compare two fields as part of a query is a huge pain, huge pain. Um, you cannot do things that sound simple like. You know, let's say you have on the account, let's just pick the account entity because most people are familiar with that. In the account entity, we have a field called primary contact. And let's just say you added a custom field called like um, billing contact. Somebody who, you know, if you have any billing question, you contact them. But the primary contact is a, already a field in the system and sometimes they're different. You cannot create a fetch XML query or an advanced find whatever view that says find me any account where the primary contact is not the billing contact or the billing contact and the primary contact are the same person. You cannot do that. Why is that? Why can we have that in place? That sounds like such a basic, you know, filtering capability to me. Um, so that limit needs to go away. I'll give you another one. 5,000 record limits return. That's a huge pain, right? That when you go to a view, it says you have 5,000 plus records. You can never get a count. In dynamics because it only returns 5,000 and then yes you can keep you can keep clicking next 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 on the 250 records per page and ultimately you'll get to whatever page number 114 or whatever how many records you have but it's never gonna tell you how much they are so people have to resort to using other options like well maybe you can export all the records to Excel and assuming they're less than a hundred thousand which is the current limit on Excel which by the way can be increased to up to a million and we have a Two Minute Tuesday episode coming up talking about that and showing you how to increase it to a million if you want to. So subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done that. But I digress. I go back to the fact that you either have to export to Excel so you can count the rows or you have to use a tool like uh, the Fetch XML View Record Counter on the XRM Toolbox just to keep pushing for the XRM toolbox and how important it is of a tool for us that has a tool that actually counts the records. But it's not that it violates the limits of Fetch XML, which is what we're talking about in this one, which is what I'm talking about getting rid of those limits. It's not that it violates those limits. No, it actually essentially clicks on the next, 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 next page and it counts the records for you. Now, it doesn't do it 250 at a time. It does it 5,000 at a time, but it still has to query 5,000 and let's just say click on next page, count 5,000 again, next page, count 5,000 again until it gets to the end where the result will be like, you know, 3,800 or whatever. And then it ultimately kept track of them and says, you have 124,300 records or whatever it is, or 1,023,800 3, records if you count them that way. So the, why? Why Why have that limit? Now, I understand that some of these limits are for performance reasons, but these limits were introduced in like CRM 4, CRM 2011, CRM 2013. We're talking about five years ago, 10 years ago, eight years ago, right? I realized that back then 
when you had you know a server that had eight gigs of RAM or or something like that, trying to list you know a hundred thousand records at once was hard on on a system. But today servers have like a terabyte of RAM, like they are able to do that. So give us an opportunity to select our own record limits. We can do that, right? And and we'll deal with the performance implications. Just put warnings on, on the tools, on the settings within the system settings that says, you know, something like uh, record fetch XML record limit return or record returns or whatever. And he has 5,000 on it already. Let me pick 50,000 and see what happens, right? And just have a warning that says, attention, please. If you change this record limit, your system might become too slow, you know, to, for usage. Let me pick that, right? And if you want, you can add a, a warning that says, you know, uh, tickets open because your system is too slow after you change this will cost $1,000, whatever. But at least give us the chance to do it. Here's another limit, for example, that I think should be available for us to change because it was, again, one of those limits that was added due to performance implications and performance concerns. 50,000 record limit on aggregation when you're using charts or when you're using formulas, the fact that you have 50,000 records as a limit, and I'm sure all of you have seen this, you're trying to load a dashboard or a chart that has more than 50,000 records, you get an error that says, sorry, you have too many records, right? It's 50,000 records, 50,000 accounts or 50,000 contacts or 50,000 opportunities is not a whole lot especially after five or seven years or whatever of, of records, depending on how many customers you do. I mean, if you're a B2C kind of organization, business to consumer directly, and you're selling, let's say, microwaves out there, 50,000 microwaves, if you're a, you know, if you're a big company, I don't know what big, I'm going to say GE, right? Big microwave manufacturer, GE, um, and I don't know this, but let's just say that's the case. Um, 50,000 records is nothing, nothing right? You're selling cell phones? Like how many iPhones does Apple sell like every day? Millions. I, I don't even know. But 50,000 uh, records is nothing for some of these companies. Um, for me, like every time I have a project where I'm dealing with like an insurance company, I know I'm going to struggle with this one. Because if every time I'm going to try to do any type of aggregation when it comes to policies, when it comes to claims, when it comes to anything that has to do with insurance, which is mass in mass, right? You're insuring boats or whatever it is that you're insuring. You're doing this in thousands or millions in some cases, if possible. Imagine, you know, having a 50,000 record limit for a company like Nationwide Insurance or Geico Insurance or, you know, whatever it is. If you're not in the U.S., these are, you know, big insurance companies in the U.S. 50,000 records? It's nothing, nothing. It, they're going to violate that no matter what. Like it's just, it's going to be too hard. Like in some cases, they're going to go over the limit with just looking at records from today. Just show me records today. They're already over 50,000. So um, I think that record should be available for us to be changed. And I know for some of you who've been around the block for a while, you know that this can be changed on premise. You can go to your SQL database. There's a setting in there called aggregate query record limit that you can change. You can increase that to half a million if you want. You can increase the 50,000 record limit to whatever number you want. The problem with that, obviously, is that performance will be uh, impacted by it because now it's going to take longer for these dashboards or charts or whatever you're doing to calculate, to aggregate all those numbers together because, you know, you have... 10 times the size. I get that. But at least let us make that decision. Let the professional, the CRM admin, the organization, the owner of it, the company paying for the software, let them make the decision on whether it's okay for them to wait 30 seconds or a minute or five minutes even for a dashboard to load that shows me the information or have a dashboard that takes five seconds to tell me that I have too much data and I can't see anything. I'd rather wait. I'd rather wait five minutes before my meeting. Okay, guys, here it is. Here's the information loaded. Finally, it took five minutes, but here it is. Let's talk about it. Let's drill in. Let's whatever, right? I can see it. I'm using what I'm paying for rather than being stuck on the 50,000 record limit. And once again, 
this limit is changeable. You can change it on-prem, but we don't have access to the online database, so we cannot change it online. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, you know, I can always set up data export service and copy, you know, my database into Azure SQL. And once it's in Azure SQL, I'll be able to change it. And then I can run my charts and dashboards against my Azure SQL uh, replica of the database. Yes, you can do that. You can spend the whole day working on this to make it work. Or Microsoft can add this for us and we can do it in Dynamics. I, you know, I that's that's the way I see it is there are walk you know workarounds for a lot of these functionality and the things that I'm talking about here but I feel that they they shouldn't have to exist we if we have a way to work around it and get to that result then that functionality should be in the system already um, that's the way I see it Again, there's a couple more limits in Fetch XML, things like you cannot have more than 10 linked entities, right? So if you're, you know, and you know, if you're keeping your solution complex, this might be something you never hit. But if you have, you know, account and under account, you have an entity and another entity and another entity and another, you have, if you have more than 10 on that, you know, uh, sort of level, parent-child relationship kind of level, there's a point where you're not going to be able to go any further. Now, again, I don't know how many people will be affected by this, not affected by this uh, often, obviously, but if you're in a complex situation, um, this might be a limit. There's also, I remember reading once that there's a limit of, uh, it's it's over 2,000 types of um, um, filters you can apply into an advanced find or a fetch XML query. Now, how many of you have had ever the need to create an advanced find query that has over 2,000 filters on them? Right? It's you know some of these limits are really out there. Something that you know one implementation in the world in 10 years will will hit it. Um, but some of these other records, like the fact that we can only retrieve 5,000 or 50,000, if I'm aggregating them, those, those hit almost every implementation. Uh, these are not big numbers anymore, at least. Uh, so I think they should be removed. Um, there's some other things like left outer join flexibility. Um, you know, right now we do have left outer join and I feel that it was added sort of to check the box. But it's not very flexible. And left outer join, by the way, is the ability for us to find records that don't have data. So, for example, it's easy for me to find an account that has primary contacts. So I can create a view, super easy, find accounts where the status is active and where the primary contact contains data. Boom, fine. Here it is. There's your list, 5,000 plus, right? So you that creating that view is easy. But how do you do a view where the relationship is child records below and you, you want to see what's below. So I'll give you an example. How do you find accounts that don't have contacts or accounts that don't have opportunities? It's pretty tough until left outer join was uh, introduced. Left outer join was initially introduced as an improvement. And I remember we had, there was an MVP summit about four years ago or something like that. And, um, you know, during the MVP summit every year, we get to do our top 10 ask top 10 again, there you go, top 10 asks for Microsoft. So MVPs put together a list, we get together and we essentially come up with a list of like 50 things and then we all vote uh, on them. And the top 10, they got the most votes, will make it to the session and at the end of the MVP summit, uh, we get the entire product team or at least the product team leadership of Microsoft in the room and we present to them, here are our top 10 things that we want to see in Dynamics. And a few years ago, number one, the one that received the most votes was left outer joints in Fetch XML. Um, and actually, there were we came up with a list of 10 improvements that we wanted to see in Fetch XML. Um, and Microsoft listened to us and the very next version left outer join was introduced uh, in Dynamics. However, it was only introduced if you were creating custom reports or if you were creating custom views behind the scenes. It wasn't available through advanced find. There wasn't a user interface or a GUI way to uh, leverage left outer join. So it was sort of like check the box. Yes, we can do it, but there's no easy way for you to do it anyway. Um, so that was, that was an interesting one. And then, you know, later on, I don't remember how long after the actual left outer joint capability came out, I would say a year and a half, maybe later, or maybe a year later, then the actual UI side of it, the fact that now we can create, um, you know, advanced find, for example, where 
you know, find me any accounts that don't have any opportunities. That is actually a capability today. You can actually do that. Um, you know, if, if you don't know how to do it, again, we recorded a two minute Tuesday video on our YouTube channel uh, showing you how to do it. But it's not flexible. And it's not flexible in the sense that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an absolute. I can search for accounts that don't have opportunities. I can search for um, accounts that don't have contacts. But I cannot search for accounts that don't have opportunities over $10,000 or that don't have opportunities created this year. I cannot go like a little level after that. Uh, I would love to see that. I would love to be able to say, find me an account that we haven't called in three months. Not be forced to say, find me an account that we have never called. Right. So right now it works in absolutes. I want to see more flexibility. Now I realize there's a workaround for this. And as I mentioned, virtually all of the items on the list, there's a workaround, but that doesn't mean that we should have to rely on that workaround. The workaround in that case is you could create a calculated or a roll up field that says, show me, you know, uh, on the roll up field conditions, you could say, roll up how many opportunities in this year are over 10,000 or whatever. And then you can use advanced find to say, find me any account where this roll up field equals more than zero or contains, you know, something more than zero. Because at that point, if it has one, two, whatever, you know that there are some opportunities behind the scenes that are, you know, match the condition that you want. So again, you can use roll up fields to sort of find whatever combination you want, but why? Why do we have to rely on that? Why not have it in advanced find make it easier for us, make it, you know, flexible so I can go in there and create whatever left out or join I want. So again, if you think about it, comparing fields, record limits, whether it's return or aggregation, uh, the linked entities, the left out or join being flexible, you know, all these limits were sort of introduced in Fetch XML back in CRM4 2011, whenever Fetch XML came up to be. I, I don't even remember when, when it was available, um, but they haven't really changed ever. Uh, those are the limitations from the original Fetch XML. So go ahead and get rid of it. Uh, sort of not get rid of Fetch XML as a whole because we still need to use advanced find and all of that, but give us Fetch XML 2. Uh, fetch, fetch XML version 2. Fetch, fetch XML unlimited whatever, give me the next version that allows me to move those record limits. It allows me to sort of bust through those walls and those limitations. Um, that will be, you know, number 10 on my list of features that should be removed from Dynamics 365 customer engagement. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. As always, uh, tune in to crmmvppodcast.com for a list of all of our episodes if you want to go back and listen to them. I've also noticed that a lot of people have been leaving comments on the episodes, and that, that's awesome because we get to interact that way. We get to answer uh, each other back and forward. I've seen people picking sides there as well. If we have controversial topics like manage versus unmanaged, they go in there and they say team unmanaged or team manage, uh, which is great. So, yeah, again, go to crmmvppodcast.com to uh, look at the, the episodes and leave some notes and obviously follow us on Twitter at CRMMVP podcast. If you have any ideas for future episodes, or if you have any guests uh, that you want me to talk to on any future episode, uh, drop us a line there also at info at CRMMVP podcast.com, our email address, uh, anything um, that you have any comments, questions, or concerns, feel free to reach out. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. As I mentioned, episode number 40 will be the top 10 or not top 10, but the 10 features that should be added to Dynamics 365 customer engagement. We'll see how we do. Hopefully you agree with us in some of these uh, some of these items, so you agree with me in some of these items that should be wiped out. If you didn't, let me know. And then uh, let's see if we can do better on episode number 40. So we'll see you again two weeks from now.